Was the Vietnam War justified? Oh my God, from the beginning, that is a bit of a crazy statement to start with. But genuinely, that is a real and genuine question. Over the course of the 1960s, the United States had become mired in an expanding conflict in Vietnam that had begun years earlier with the French in their colonial territory. This is something that would prove to be America's longest and most controversial war, at least going into the years until the war in Afghanistan. Over the course of this conflict, some 2.5 million men and women would serve in Vietnam and over 58,000 of these would lose their lives. Now, my grandfather was not among these numbers who ended up losing their lives, but he is among the many soldiers who would return home mentally and physically scarred from the war. American intervention, which finally ended in 1973, would cost billions of dollars, and simultaneously from that would cost Lyndon B. Johnson the presidency. It is something that fractured the national consensus about foreign policy that had existed since 1945. It is something that eroded morality within the military, and it is simultaneously something that spawned massive protests and violence at home. And really, in the end, South Vietnam still fell to the North Vietnamese communists in 1975, making the entire thing seem, well, kind of pointless in the first place. But again, was it justified? I'm going to go ahead and say this right now, but this is probably the closest that this channel is ever going to come to actually making a political or opinion piece about any kind of subject. Because the question that we're talking about here is something that is inherently subjective. Because when we're talking about this, we're talking about history. And history, unfortunately, in many cases, is oftentimes looked at through the lens of might makes right, at least in certain contexts. And simultaneously from that, history is something that is told by the victors of a conflict. But really, there were no real victors when it came to Vietnam. And even without any real victors, this is definitely still a war that the United States lost. But in order to dive into the subject we're going to be talking about today, there's a couple things that we're going to need to set up with this video. Number one, the background of the war and then current geopolitics. Number two, the U.S. involvement in the war itself. And number three, the lies and beliefs of the conflict. Also, before we go and continue any further, I'm going to ask that you like, comment, and subscribe. And simultaneously, I have to pitch my own thing here because the video itself is not sponsored. But my friends, if you'd hear me out for just a second, my wife and I are going to be leading a trip to Peru this next July, from July 18th through the 25th. And we're going to be seeing a variety of different things there. We're going to be hiking Machu Picchu. We're going to be going to see Rainbow Mountain. We're going to be tasting the local food of Peru. It's going to be a wonderful experience. Experience. At the time that I'm making this, there are only a couple of the early bird spots left that actually get a discount. And remember, you only have to put 25% down when you sign up. So by all means, click the link down in the description and join us on this adventure. And if Peru is not necessarily up to your speed, there are only nine spots left in our trip to Italy. So if you want to see ancient Rome and Florence and all the monuments of that, then again, I'm going to be leaving a link down in the description. Thank you, my friends. And back to the video. When we are talking about the Vietnam War, one has to first understand that that is not something that occurred as a kind of isolated incident. This is something that occurred as a direct result of colonialism. If we go back and look at Vietnam's colonial history, it is something that became a French colony in 1877 with the founding of French Indochina. This being something that would include Tonkin, Annam, Cochin China, and Cambodia, with Laos being added in 1893. The status quo in this region would persist for many years before the French would ultimately lose control of their colony briefly during World War II after they were first occupied by the Germans, and then the region was occupied by Japanese. Japanese troops. And as Japan and France would fight over the region and specifically control over Vietnam, an independence movement would start to form under Ho Chi Minh, who was a revolutionary leader that had been inspired by Lenin's Bolshevik Revolution. This is the individual who had established the League for the Independence of Vietnam, better known as the Viet Minh in May of 1941. Of course, that all being said, we know how things went for the Japanese. Eventually, the French would regain control of their colony, at least partially, because what would follow afterwards is conflict between the French and the Viet Minh. The conflict between the French and the Viet Minh would then come to a head at the decisive battle of Dien Bien Phu, this being something that would mark the end of French rule in Vietnam. Now really, here, at the end of French rule, the question of who would actually rule Vietnam and how, well this is something that would draw interest from world superpowers who would carefully watch the situation in Vietnam unfold, oftentimes with growing unease. Fast forward a little bit of time and the Geneva Accords would be signed in July of 1954, something that would split Vietnam at the 17th parallel. Effectively, what would happen is that North Vietnam would be ruled by Ho Chi Minh's communist government, and South Vietnam were going to be led by Emperor Bao Dai. An election would be scheduled for two years' time to unify Vietnam, but the United States, fearful that a national election would end up leading to communist rule, would ensure that this is something that would never take place. 
And if you're wondering why, well, the answer to that is the Cold War, naturally speaking. I mean, you have to understand that Vietnam was divided during the Cold War when tensions between the United States and the Soviet Union were at an all-time high. Mao Zedong had just proclaimed the creation of the People's Republic of China in 1949, and in January of 1950, China would join with the Soviet Union to formally recognize the Communist Democratic Republic of Vietnam. And so it is during all of this, into this setting of the Cold War, that the U.S. would practice a policy of containment. Specifically, President Harry S. Truman's Truman Doctrine would pledge political, military, and economic assistance to democratic nations that were facing threats from communist forces. His successor, President Dwight D. Eisenhower, would put forth the domino theory that a communist victory in Vietnam is something that would create a domino effect in Southeast Asia and therefore was something that needed to be prevented at all costs. But is that something that really happened? Well, in the case of South Vietnam, Emperor Bao Dai was succeeded by the Catholic nationalist Ngo Dinh Diem. He was strong in his anti-communist stance, and this was something that initially was popular with Americans who would help him rise to power. But there's a little bit of a problem. Diem's preferential treatment to a Catholic minority would simultaneously then lead to protests throughout South Vietnam, as well as with his more authoritarian measures. This is something that made him a rather unpopular leader. During all all this, the United States would provide massive amounts of supplies, of weapons, food, money, everything they could to prop up this corrupt regime. And in exchange, what the United States wanted from South Vietnam were efforts to democratize the country, to open up trade, to ease restrictions and crackdowns and political punishments. But despite all the aid and negotiation, Diem would continue to resist American demands that he reform the political and economic structure of the country in order to try and generate public support for his regime. He preferred to operate things specifically as he saw fit. And by mid-1963, students and Buddhists were protesting in the streets in large numbers, and some monks were even setting themselves on fire as a way to kind of draw world attention to the situation. President John F. Kennedy of the United States would then respond by sending American military advisors in order to shore up the government as well as the military, but the situation is something that over time would only continue to deteriorate. And deteriorate it did. By the time that 1963 went and rolled around, Kennedy's advisors had decided like, hey, no, Diem has got to go. This guy is, is not going to be helpful for any of our plans. And so the United States went and encouraged South Vietnamese generals to go and stage a coup against him. In November, this coup would ultimately occur and Diem as well as his brother would end up being killed, but unfortunately, the successors of this regime were no greater in their success than the current or former, rather, regime had been. North Vietnamese forces, the Viet Cong, would then take advantage of the situation and continuously step up their attacks, seeking to create as much instability in the South as they possibly could and overthrow the regime. By the time that John F. Kennedy was assassinated only a few weeks later, on November 22nd, 1963, there were 16,000 American military personnel in Vietnam. And with the assassination of President Kennedy, that would give us the rise of President Lyndon B. Johnson. And really, looking at this entire situation, you almost want to feel bad for the guy. Because the decision of Vietnam that he inherited was something that no matter what it is that he chose was going to be something that was going to bite him. Politically, personally, nationally, something was going to hurt. Either he could go and pull out of South Vietnam, effectively abandoning the country to communist forces, something that could have been tantamount to political suicide, or he could step in and effectively assume direct responsibility for the military defense of the country, something that could embroil America in a years-long conflict that would also be tantamount to political suicide, depending upon its outcome. And we already kind of know how that all went down. See, going into the conflict, Johnson feared that a deepening American commitment to Southeast Asia is something that would end up destroying the vision that he had of the Great Society, something that I could possibly dive into in a future video. But simultaneously, he didn't want to be accused of losing Southeast Asia to communism, as Truman had been accused of losing China. He said, and I quote, I'm not going to lose Vietnam. I am not going to be the president who saw Southeast Asia go the way that China went. So you can kind of get a mind of exactly what it was that he was thinking at that time. And while all of these questions were playing out in Johnson's head, something else would happen that would effectively decide things for the United States. 
It is during this period of instability that the Gulf of Tonkin incident, also known as the USS Maddox incident, would occur. And the result of that would be the formal entry of the United States into the conflict that would become the Vietnam War. And I'm going to need to go ahead and explain this thing here really briefly. The way that the incident that we're talking about played out is that on August 2nd, 1964, the USS Maddox would encounter three Soviet-built North Vietnamese torpedo boats in the Gulf of Tonkin. The Maddox would fire on what it described as warning shots and and it was in turn met by torpedo and machine gun fire. On August 4th, the USS destroyer Turner Joy, as well as the USS Maddox, would report that they had been ambushed, though the Turner Joy's account has since been called into question by historians, but more on that later. Either way from this, the United States had been attacked not just once, but twice in something that seemed at the time to be completely unprovoked. And so almost immediately after, on August 7th, the House and the Senate would pass the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution, something that would almost unanimously grant President Lyndon B. Johnson the power to, quote, take all necessary measures to repeal any armed attack against the forces of the United States and to prevent any further aggression. America's war in Vietnam had effectively just begun. Now, the interesting thing that we have to note here is that going into the conflict in the first place, President Johnson's goal for U.S. involvement in Vietnam was not for overwhelming American force to take out the enemy. No, instead, it was for the United States to effectively prop up South Vietnamese defenses until South Vietnam itself could actually win its own war. And so by entering the Vietnam War without a clear goal, a clear plan, everything in mind, this is something that would only lead to more disappointment, to more confusion and half-hearted actions by the United States that would gradually over time have to be escalated. Because effectively, what would happen is that the United States would find itself in a stalemate with the North Vietnamese. And with casualties mounting every single day, this is something that as more and more time passed, the more unpopular the war became. And it really was a stalemate. From 1965 to 1969, the U.S. was involved in a limited war in Vietnam. Although there were aerial bombings of the North, President Johnson specifically wanted fighting to be limited to South Vietnam. And by limiting the fighting parameters, U.S. forces were not going to conduct a serious ground assault into the North in order to attack the communists directly. Nor was there going to be any kind of strong effort to disrupt the Ho Chi Minh Trail, which is the Viet Cong supply path that ran through Laos and Cambodia. Which obviously, going back and looking at the situation, with hindsight being 2020, we know now that that was an extremely bad choice to make. Say what you want about the morality of the war in the first place, the overall strategy going into the situation was just bad. This was not any kind of conventional war like the great powers had been used to, as U.S. troops were now fighting a jungle war, something that was mostly against the well-supplied Viet Cong. The Viet Cong would attack in ambushes, they would set up booby traps, they would also escape through a complex network of underground tunnels. For U.S. forces, even just finding the enemy to shoot at in the first place was something that was hard. And since the Viet Cong would just hide in the dense brush, U.S. forces would drop Agent Orange or napalm bombs, things which would clear entire areas by causing the leaves to drop off or to just burn away outright. From 1961 to 1971, the U.S. would spray over 20 million gallons of Agent Orange, which, mind you, is a carcinogen, across more than 4.5 million acres of Vietnam. This was something that was supposed to stop the Viet Cong and North Vietnamese soldiers from being able to hide. It was something that was supposed to specifically target them. But in the years following the war, it was something that would pollute the waterways. It would pollute the soil, the air, and from that caused mass devastation of the entire country. In March of 1968, the atrocities would effectively reach an entire new level with something that would become known as the My Lai Massacre. In this event, U.S. soldiers would torture and murder around 500 unarmed South Vietnamese civilians. This is something that would include men, women, children, and even infants. The massacre had effectively been covered up for a year before the story was revealed, and soldiers who had tried to intervene or protect the civilians were shunned as traitors, while the perpetrators of the massacre would face little or really no consequences. From this awful thing that would occur, only one soldier would end up being convicted of a criminal offense, and this individual would only wind up serving a little over three years under house arrest. And obviously, I'm not going to make excuses for why any of these events occurred, but one simultaneously has to understand the context in which they occurred. Vietnam was a conflict in which effectively anyone could be an enemy. You had no idea. Going into a village, U.S. troops had great difficulty determining who, if any, of the villagers were actually affiliated with the Viet Cong. This being because even women and children were capable of setting up booby traps or pulling out a weapon and attacking soldiers in surprise. 
And so with time, U.S. morale within Vietnam would plummet. It was a place in which effectively every possible person, every sound, every waking moment, anything around you could potentially be an enemy. And that is not a healthy mentality to have. Soldiers during the conflict would oftentimes suffer from low morale. Many of them would become very angry. And after and during the war, a number of them would end up turning to substance abuse in order to get by. And the situation was not something that was just going to simply improve. Because on January 30th, 1968, the North Vietnamese would surprise both the United States as well as South Vietnamese forces by orchestrating a massive coordinated assault with the Viet Cong to attack about 100 South Vietnamese cities and towns. Although the United States and South Vietnam were able to repel the assault, something that would become known as the Tet Offensive, this attack would prove to the Americans that the enemy was significantly stronger and better organized than they had been led to believe. The Tet Offensive that we're talking about here was effectively a turning point in the war because President Johnson, who was now faced with a very unhappy American public, as well as bad news from his military leaders in Vietnam, decided that he was no longer going to escalate the war. Prior to this, many Americans, including activists from the civil rights movement, were already very angry about the war. The draft, in particular during this time period, had targeted poor black and brown people of color, as well as poor whites, who were not in a kind of position to be able to get college deferments or service in the reserves or National Guard. This means that in a very unpopular war, many of these individuals would be drafted and sent to Vietnam. And at some points during the conflict, the draft rate and the casualty rate for black men was twice that of white men. The home situation was not looking good, and political-wise, the administration was faltering. And as the administration faltered, this in turn would lead to, in 1969, the rise of Richard Nixon, the man who would become the next U.S. president with his own idea of how to end the conflict in Vietnam. What President Nixon would do is outline a plan that he called Vietnamization, something which was a process to remove U.S. troops from Vietnam while handing back the fighting to the South Vietnamese. The withdrawal of U.S. troops is something that would begin in July of 1969, and would continue over the next couple years until the end of the conflict. Now, that is not to say that this was a complete withdrawal, because that is most certainly not the case. President Nixon would expand the war into other countries, such as Laos and Cambodia, a move that would create thousands of protests, especially on college campuses back in America. For the next four years, the United States would gradually remove more and more of its forces from Vietnam, leaving South Vietnam to step up its own defense. And when the United States had withdrawn most of its troops from Vietnam, the North Vietnamese would stage another massive assault something called the Easter Offensive, or also called the Spring Offensive, on March 30th, 1972. In it, North Vietnamese troops would cross over the demilitarized zone, the DMZ, at the 17th parallel and invade South Vietnam. The remaining U.S. forces and South Vietnamese army would fight back and would succeed in defending the South, but really, this was only the latest sign of the end. On January 27th, 1973, because on January 27th, 1973, peace talks in Paris would finally succeed in producing a ceasefire agreement. The last of the U.S. troops would end up leaving on March 29th, 1973, but the troops and the leaders and everyone who left knew that the force that they were leaving behind in South Vietnam, the South Vietnam government and its army, were something that were hopelessly weak and were not going to be able to stand up against the Communist North. After the United States had withdrawn all of the troops, the fighting would then continue. In March of 1975, North Vietnam would make another big push towards the South, something that very quickly, very rapidly would end up top the South Vietnamese government. South Vietnam would officially surrender to the Communist North on April 30th, 1975. And from that, only a year later, on July 2nd, 1976, Vietnam was officially reunited as a communist country, the Socialist Republic of Vietnam. For all of its efforts, the United States had lost its first ever war. And here's really the thing that I have to say right now. Looking back on this whole conflict half a century later in the United States, it is very obvious from this that with the withdrawal of South Vietnam, with the failure of its policy, with the failure of everything from the conflict, that the United States had lost the Vietnam War. No matter what it is that anyone says online about the Vietnam War not being a real war and that it doesn't count because there was no peace treaty. No, the United States absolutely lost the Vietnam War. The ideological goals that it set out to accomplish in the first place were not met, and those in turn were met with abject failure. But weirdly enough, what they did win overall in the end was peace. 
It would honestly make a very interesting alternate history video, but it's really difficult to imagine just how things could have turned out better if the United States had actually won in Vietnam, if that was even possible in the first place. Even to this day, the United States still remains as the strongest power, the dominant power in the Asia Pacific region, even with the rise of China. The alliances with states such as Japan, such as with South Korea, such as Australia, these are things that only strengthen US presence in the region. Even US relations with China are extensive, even if not always so warm and welcoming, which I understand me saying that right now is a severe understatement considering modern tension, but hey, I've already done a video on that. But the strangest part about perhaps all of this this is the current relations that the United States has with Vietnam. Despite the conflict that we just talked about, despite all the horrors that were inflicted during the war, the relationship between the United States and Vietnam is actually a very positive one today. The region is mostly democratic, it is significantly more wealthy than it was, and it is actually seen as a very key strategic partner in the strategy to contain China. Whether or not that could have actually happened if the United States had won the war with Vietnam in the first place, well, who can really say? And before I get a whole bunch of angry people to come into my comment section blasting me for saying that, no, this does not justify the war. And the question of that justification is the entire point of this video that I'm making right now. So are you ready for it? Was the Vietnam War justified? Well, this is going to piss off a whole bunch of people, but the answer is yes and no. Oh yeah, no, I, I, I know. I know exactly what kind of comments I'm going to be seeing right now here, but guys, guys, please. Hear me out on this. I can hear you all clicking away right now calling me a fence sitter, but you have to understand that that is not what I am doing right here. The definition of when something is justified is when something is done for or marked by a good or legitimate reason. And I am not saying that the Vietnam War is good. That That is absolutely not the case. Don't, I, guys. No, I understand that it is something that still sounds kind of murky here. But what about legitimate? Legitimate is conforming to the law or to rules. And really, that is where the entire thing here comes into question. Because my friends, by the standard of the day and the thought process of the Cold War between the Soviet Union and the United States, the fear of a domino effect in newly decolonized states, of new communist powers arising, which in turn was going to lead to other communist powers arising within the region, that was a very real possibility for the United States government at least to those who actually believed in it and held power. Because my friends, I know that this is going to piss off a lot of people when I say this, but there is a very key difference between a legitimate fear and something actually being correct and supported. You can still have a legitimate fear that you feel is justified. It does not mean that it is true. None of what I am talking about today changes the reality that the Vietnam War was definitely the wrong war. It was something that was unnecessary. And I know for me saying that, that a number of people are going to be upset, but guys, this in no way changes cheapens or in any way detracts from the sacrifice of so many Americans. Rather, the judgment in this scenario is a very strategic one. The reality of the situation is that the American commitment to Vietnam over so many years and so many billions of dollars later is something that severely exaggerated its importance. Because really, think about it. What happened on the ground in that country would in no way alter the basic shape of the strategic competition between the United States and the Soviet Union. This was a conflict that really was nothing more than a distraction, one that wasted resources of every single kind, from money to fuel and metal to human life, it was something that overall was a waste. And the idea that the war was something that fundamentally affected U.S. interests everywhere, well, that was wrong. And the aftermath of the Vietnam War was not the only thing that the United States was wrong about. Lies were effectively a dime a dozen for anything that involved this conflict. And that, and really that brings us to the crux of what it is that I'm arguing here today. The lies that I am talking about were repeated to the public. They were things that were told to Congress. They were things that were said in closed door hearings. These were things that were said in speeches into the press. And really, the real story might have remained unknown if not in 1967 when Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara had not commissioned a secret history based on classified documents, something which came to be known as the Pentagon Papers. Eventually, leaked portions of the report that we're talking about here would come to the New York Times, which in turn would publish excerpts in 1971. The photographs of Vietnamese civilians fleeing U.S. air attacks and the endless protests and counter-protests that were dividing the country, people were sick 
and tired of it. The country was more divided than anything in recent memory. I mean, you have to understand that the lies that were revealed in this paper were of a generational scale. These were things that were so significant that it would change the entire way that the American public would view their own government for decades to come. Even going to the modern day where people distrust their government, that is not something that had really been commonplace prior to Vietnam. Officially titled the, quote, Report of the Office of the Secretary of Defense Vietnam Task Force, the papers would fill 47 volumes, covering the administration of President Franklin D. Roosevelt all the way to President Lyndon B. Johnson. The 7,000 pages would chronicle in very cold, bureaucratic language how the United States had gotten itself stuck in a long and costly war in this small Southeast Asian country where there wasn't really any kind of real strategic importance. Because here's the thing, my friends. Over the course of this video, we've already covered the general history of the Vietnam War war, or at least what has been recorded about it, but we haven't talked about the dirty little details of it. And I'm going to kind of explain that here. As I said so before, the United States really should never have gotten involved in Vietnam. The greatest problem was the decision in trying to support the French in the first place after pushing for decolonization in other areas. President Harry S. Truman had subsidized the efforts of the French to try and take back their colonies, and from this, it was something that was only going to be unsuccessful. The Vietnamese nationalists were winning their fight for independence under the leadership of Ho Chi Minh, who was, yes, a communist. But the ironic thing is that Ho had actually worked with the United States against Japan back in World War II. But in the new age of the Cold War, of right versus left, of communism versus capitalism, of east versus west, Washington was going to end up recasting him as someone who was an agent of the Soviet Union. And even though that was the official political stance of the United States, that Ho Chi Minh was an agent of the Soviet Union that was going to bring about Soviet influence inside of Southeast Asia, American intelligence was saying otherwise that they had no evidence whatsoever that there was a Soviet plot to overtake Vietnam, much less really anything in Southeast Asia. In fact, as one State Department memo would put it, quote, if there is a Moscow-directed conspiracy in Southeast Asia, Indochina is an anomaly. But considering what U.S. politicians had already seen under Mao Zedong with the rise of communist China and their victory in the Civil War, President Eisenhower would say that defeating Vietnamese communists was something that was essential in order to block further communist expansion in Asia, something that would harken back to the idea of the domino effect. Because if Vietnam became communist, then that means that all the other countries of Southeast Asia could potentially fall to communism as well. This belief in the domino theory, the thing that would start this entire conflict, was so strong that the United States would break with its European allies and refuse to sign the 1954 Geneva Accords that ended the French War. Instead, the United States would continue the fight, giving full backing to Din Diem, who was, as I had mentioned earlier in this video, the very autocratic, very anti communist leader of South Vietnam. The problem was, is that he wasn't good. The American general, J. Lawton Collins, would actually write from Vietnam warning Eisenhower that Diem was very unpopular. He was also someone that was just an incapable leader and was an individual that needed to be replaced. If not, then as Collins would write, I recommend reevaluation of our plans for assisting Southeast Asia. Nine years then, and billions of dollars later, Dien was still in power, and it was proving to be a bit of a problem, something that President John F. Kennedy was going to have to fix. Because if we are looking at this entire thing in the context of the Cold War, after facing down the Soviet Union in the Berlin crisis, John F. Kennedy specifically wanted to avoid any signs of Cold War fatigue. And so he rather easily accepted Robert McNamara's push to deepen the U.S. commitment to Saigon. At this advice, the President of the United States would increase U.S. military advisors' numbers by tenfold in the country of Vietnam and would also introduce helicopter missions. And in return for that support, Kennedy specifically wanted Diem to make democratic reforms, but these were refused. And this is something that would prove to be a problem as more and more people within the country of South Vietnam would rise up against the government. A popular uprising led by Buddhist clerics would follow all this, and fearful of losing power as well, South Vietnamese generals would secretly receive American approval to overthrow Diem. And despite official denials from the U.S., they were indeed deeply involved in the entire thing. As the Pentagon Papers would put it, quote, beginning in August of 1963, we variously authorized, sanctioned, and encouraged the coup efforts. We maintained clandestine contacts with them throughout the planning and execution of the coup and sought to review their operational plans. 
The coup, as I said earlier, would end with Diem being killed, and from this, a deepening of the American involvement in the war. And as the authors of the paper would conclude, quote, our complicity in his overthrow would heighten our responsibilities and our commitment. Three weeks later after this, President Kennedy would then be assassinated, and the Vietnam issue would have to fall to President Johnson. But the problem for Lyndon B. Johnson at this point was that there was really nothing that could get the United States fully involved. Yes, they could send military support. Yes, they could send supplies. Yes, they could send all these things, but there was nothing that could really get the American public behind them if they should go and attack Vietnam. There was no Pearl Harbor moment, effectively, as you had seen earlier in World War II. But the moment that the U.S. government needed would come on August 4th, 1964, when the White House would go and announce that a North Vietnamese attack had occurred on the USS Maddox, this being the Gulf of Tonkin incident that we had talked about earlier. Although the whole thing was framed as unprovoked aggression, that could not be further from the truth. Because prior to all of this, the general that you can see behind me here, this is General William C. Westmoreland, the guy who was the head of the U.S. forces in Vietnam at the time. And prior to the United States entering into the Vietnam War, he was the person that was heading up and commanding South Vietnam forces that were launching clandestine raids onto North Vietnam. I'm going to go ahead and say this right now, but this whole thing is not a clean conflict. It's not something that just immediately started. Both the North and the South were launching raids continuously into one another. So it's not like we can just equally blame one side and that is it. But naturally, because of the conflict and raids that were happening, North Vietnamese PT boats were already on the lookout for South Vietnamese forces. And when they spied the USS Maddox, they mistook it for a South Vietnamese escort vessel, at least according to the official report. But later investigations would show that the attack that we're talking about here never actually took place. Or rather, I should specify that the second one did not. Yes, there was an actual Gulf of Tonkin incident that occurred. A number of people online will try to deny that anything happened whatsoever, but it really does seem that on August 2nd, the Maddox was indeed attacked by North Vietnamese torpedo boats. The problem then comes is that two days later on August 4th, the Johnson administration would claim that yet another attack had occurred. And it was after this second attack would occur that the U.S. Congress would go and pass the Gulf of Tonkin resolution, something that would allow for the federal government to take all measures necessary in order to protect against this aggression. It was something that was tantamount to a declaration of war, but it was a lie. And that's the reality of it. After decades of public skepticism and government secrecy, the truth would eventually come out. In the early 2000s, nearly 200 documents ended up being declassified and released by the National Security Agency. And when these documents were revealed, they showed that there was no actual attack on August 4th. U.S. officials had distorted the truth about the Gulf of Tonkin incident specifically for their own gains. And perhaps this was something that was used by Johnson for his own political prospects. Testifying before the Senate, McNamara had lied, denying any American involvement in the Gulf of Tonkin attacks, saying, and I quote, our Navy played absolutely no part in, was not associated with, and was not aware of any South Vietnamese actions, if there were any. And yes, my friends, the United States was definitely involved in this conflict. They definitely were involved with South Vietnam at the time. And then as a result of the incident, three days later, we had the passing of the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution, something that would drastically expand and presidential powers to effectively allow them to wage war undeclared, and this is something that would result in Lyndon B. Johnson carrying forward his presidential election and winning by a landslide. Seven months later, Johnson would end up sending combat forces into Vietnam directly without declaring war. The initial deployment that we're talking about of 20,000 troops was something that was initially described as, quote, military support forces. And that is really it. There was nothing really new about this. It wasn't a full-scale war. And as the Pentagon Papers that I am talking about here later showed, the Department of Defense would also revise its war aims, and the entire thing is thoroughly embarrassing, because it said, and I quote, that it was to 70% avoid a humiliating U.S. defeat, 20% to keep South Vietnam and the adjacent territory from Chinese hands, and 10% to permit the people of South Vietnam to enjoy a better, freer way of life. My... Frickin' God. Now, Westmoreland, the guy that we talked about earlier who had been commanding forces in South Vietnam before, he understood that the 20,000 men that were going into this in the first place was nothing more than a stopgap, and immediately afterwards would request 100,000 more. And McNamara would agree. From the Pentagon Papers, we know that McNamara, on July 20th, 1965, wrote in a memo that he firmly believed that even though U.S. casualties were going to amount to around 500 a month, that in the end, this was going to result in an American victory in Vietnam. 
bomb. But as the papers would put it so many years later, quote, never again while he was Secretary of Defense would McNamara make so optimistic a statement about Vietnam, except in public. The man knew that things were not going well, and yet continuously he would lie and lie and lie to the public while privately having his doubts. And really, it would take several years for McNamara to realize that he was wrong, but eventually he would actually do that. In 1967, he would even write in a memo to the president saying that more of the same thing that they had been doing, more bombing, more troops, more everything, that this is not something that was going to win the war. In a complete about face, what he ended up suggesting that the United States do was to just go and declare victory and then slowly withdraw from South Vietnam to say that they had won from their original mission to protect the South Vietnamese state and from that to just leave. And from this, in a very rare acknowledgement of the suffering that the Vietnamese people were experiencing literally the entire time, he would say, and I quote, the picture of the world's greatest superpower killing or seriously injuring 1,000 non-combatants a week while trying to pound a tiny backwards nation into submission on an issue whose merits are hotly disputed is not a pretty one. Johnson, of course, was furious from this, and McNamara would end up being dismissed from his position. And instead of doing an about-face and withdrawing from Vietnam, Johnson would instead increase the number of U.S. troops that were being committed to the region, with numbers upwards to 500,000. Yes, he would force McNamara to resign, but by this time, McNamara had already ordered the creation of the Pentagon Papers in the first place, which is why we have a record of all of this occurring. But that did not change anything. Vietnam still did not go well for the United States, and in 19. 19- 68, Lyndon B. Johnson would announce that he was not going to be running for re-election. The entire thing probably would have just been terribly embarrassing. Nixon, in turn, would end up winning the White House while promising to bring peace to Vietnam, and instead, what he would end up doing is expanding the conflict by invading Cambodia. And it is because he expanded the conflict that someone then decided to go and leak the Pentagon Papers, to reveal it to the public, to send it to the press, to make people aware of what the truth of the matter was, for what was actually happening. And so after the New York Times began began publishing the Pentagon Papers on Sunday, June 13th, 1971, the nation was simply shocked. The responses, of course, would vary from person to person, with some people being angry, some people not believing it in the first place. Some were even angry that the papers had been leaked in the first place and exposed American secrets, which I guess is just one of those really weird things that people were more angry about secrets being revealed than the fact that they had been lied to for years. Opponents of the war felt vindicated. Veterans, especially those who had already served multiple tours in Vietnam, were disheartened, knowing that all of those doubts that they had had over the years, that they were real, that they They had been lied to, that their entire purpose and why so many of their friends had fought and died in this conflict, that it was all pointless. And one of the craziest things about all of this is that despite the leaks, that is not where all of this is going to end. Because the individual who did the leak in the first place of the Pentagon Papers is the individual that you can see behind me right here, Daniel Ellsberg. Convinced that Ellsberg posed a threat to Nixon's re-election campaign, the White House actually went and approved an illegal break-in at the Beverly Hills, California office of Ellsberg's psychiatrist, hoping to find something that was embarrassing, some kind of confession on file that they would be able to use against him. The burglars, who were known as the plumbers, and up finding nothing and they did get away undetected but the following june when another of these crews would break into the democratic national committee headquarters at the watergate complex in washington these guys were actually caught hence nixon and the watergate scandal which in the end is going to bring us to the final answer that we tried to clarify in this entire video essay was the vietnam war justified politically yes But then again, of course, when we're talking about politics, anyone is able to justify something politically. But in every other conceivable way, the war in Vietnam should not have happened. It was something that was kickstarted by deceit and is something that would only end in misery. It was a stain on the record of the United States that President Lyndon B. Johnson had desperately sought to avoid. It was justified by the thought of the day. But in the end... It was wrong. Everyone, this has been Sakui with the History of Everything Podcast YouTube channel. Thank you very much for watching. I ask that you like, comment, subscribe. And as I said earlier here in this video, if you would like to go to Peru with me, if you want to go to Italy, if you want to do any of these things, then make sure to click the links down in my description and also make sure to comment and let me know what it is that you'd like to see next. I have a whole series of videos that I am planning on working on here. And depending upon what you all vote in my community call, Polls, 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 polls is what I mean. That is going to determine what we are going to be doing next. I will see you all next time. Thank you very much for watching and goodbye.